Hi, everyone. Welcome to another exciting edition of Words, Images, and Worlds. Glad to be talking on this episode about literacy and comics and numeracy and all sorts of other things with comics creator, artist Stefano Gaudiano. Stefano, thank you for Perfect. jumping in and talking. With me. I, we try, we try. Um, I, I've enjoyed the conversation so far before I hit record and, and glad to have it continue. Thanks for spending some time talking. Likewise. Yeah. I'll mention a couple of titles that people might know you for, and then we can sort of resume the conversation and, and talk some comics. Um, you, you've worked Sounds on good. a variety of books, um, Batman Family, Daredevil, and oh, folks out there yeah. probably, <laughs> yep, uh, probably also know you for mm -hmm. th this little book, tiny, tiny book, uh, I'm sure, um, The Walking Dead, is that, yeah. Right, I think I remember that one, yeah. Yeah, um, so um, big title. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, it's uh, it, it's been kind of amazing. I think you know, in the end, I, I I had very much the career that I wanted to have when I was a kid uh, in comics. I was very lucky to you know, it took a while, but uh, you know, pieces fell into place. It's been a good ride. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What what led you to comics and visual arts? Um, comics were kind of around me from the time I was born, pretty much, because um, they're a pretty popular medium in Italy, uh, where even in the 1960s and 70s, when I was a kid, um, it had, uh, there was a great variety of comics being published, um, kind of like you're seeing in the United States now, where you don't just have one genre, you actually go into a bookstore and, and you can have, I, I saw you had an interview with uh, Lucy Neasley uh, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, or how do you pronounce her last name? I, nicely, I can't remember, but uh, I, I think it's nice. Uh, you know, yeah. She's great. And uh, that's a kind of work that you didn't really find in the United States when I was young, but in Italy, you, you could get all of that. And even uh, there was a more capillary way of distribution because there were newsstands everywhere and newsstands carried comics and uh even in church they would have a, a comic book magazine that was published by the church that i would read every week when i was going to church and uh it was actually quite good it's not not what you would expect it wasn't uh you know just a type of fare that you would think uh you know like the catholic publishers would uh would be putting out it was they had some really great artists some american uh Artists, I know we're familiar with uh, uh, Michaluzzi, you know, was one of the great artists that showed up in this magazine, Giornalino, and uh, Sergio Toppi was in there, an artist that Americans haven't heard of, like Gianni De Luca, that um, really inspired me. And I also saw uh, some, uh, a bunch of foreign uh, comic books of all kinds, like American newspaper strips were being repackaged in magazine form. And many households would just have subscriptions to this large size, beautiful black and white, nicely printed uh, comic publications. And uh, it was not looked down upon as kids literature, even if of course, you know, a lot of it is just humor or adventure. Mm -hmm. But I remember being exposed to some American classics like Rick Kirby, Buzz Sawyer, and uh, as well as a humor strips, Dick Tracy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as well as uh, some avant-garde things like early work from the humanoids uh, in France, like I remember seeing Philippe Brulé work early on, and, uh, um, and then from South America, Alberto Breccia is, or Brescia, I don't know how you say his name in, uh, in his own language, but um, uh, Breccia was just, it's a phenomenal artist, his art, his uh, son Enrique is, is uh, still uh, working in the field and also does beautiful work, but Alberto uh, really made an impression on me when I was, uh, I was about seven years old when I first saw his work and I was nowhere near really being able to, uh, you know, think of uh, doing art in that style because, um, you know, just very advanced, but I really appreciated it. And it came in handy as I got older, as a point of reference to sort of uh, recognize the style that I wanted to go into. Uh, but the real passion for comics actually came, you know, from Marvel Comics. It was, I, I was at a newsstand one day and I saw a John Romita cover for, um, you know, Spider-Man. I think it was maybe number 90 or something like that with, uh, you know, Dr. Octopus arms are flailing, you know, and uh, Spider-Man is there. It was just before it went into this great series with, you know, the death of Captain Stacy and then later, of course, the death of Gwen Stacy. And I was hooked. I just uh, absolutely loved that, uh, 
that series. And um, my brothers, uh, I have older brothers, and uh, this helped too because uh, my older brothers were collecting Fantastic Four. Uh-huh, and uh-huh. Captain America, and the way they were published in Italy, there would be 48 pages, so they would put in stories like Captain America had the Avengers in the back, Spider-Man had the Hulk and Daredevil, Fantastic Four had maybe Thor or something like that. So I was exposed to the early, uh, you know, eventually we started reprinting some Ditko stuff when I was about 10 years old. So I, I, I saw the first 10 years of Marvel Comics unfolding in front of me in the 1970s, basically, wow. thanks to this Italian publisher. And um, it just, you know, are you, were you a Marvel fan also growing up? Is that something that you got the bug at some point? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so you know what it's like. I mean, mm-hmm, just mm-hmm. it's uh, Spider-Man is... is um, there's something about even just the way the costume is designed. It just kind of burns itself into your brain. I, I was pleasantly surprised to find that there's people much younger than me that are huge Spider-Man fans, even before the movies came out, because they like the Todd McFarlane Spider-Man, you know? And it just, it's like, it seems like across generations, it's, uh, it leaves a mark. And I mean, my one of my kids at two years old, I, I swear I've never, I wasn't really doing Spider-Man at the time. I just never re- remember talking about it. It wasn't on television. But uh, they saw a Spider-Man balloon and immediately like were drawn to it and literally said Spider-Man, a word that like I'd never taught them as far as I can remember. <laughs> I think it's an amazing design uh, that Ditko came up with essentially. And uh, Ditko in particular, I think, you know, just uh, nailed it basically. It was just a uh, uh, very, very powerful narrative form. And the other comic books that I read, all of the Italian, European, uh, and, and even more the, you know, newspaper strip, American comics, had uh, really beautiful art and uh, humor and, and great narrative power. But, you know, what, what, what Stanley, Steve Ditko, and Jack Kirby, and the other people working there hit upon it, it was something else. It really felt almost like a, a new form of, of telling stories. And uh, of course, you know, working on what uh, uh, Jerry Siegel and, uh, you know, uh, now I'm going to confuse, is it Siegel and Schuster or is that the publisher? Uh, no, no, you're uh, right. That's Jerry right. Siegel. Schuster. Uh-huh. Yeah, okay. And um, the super superheroes in general, are a very uh, weirdly effective and powerful narrative medium, I guess, or I don't know what you would call it. It's not the genre, it's just the idea of superheroes. And obviously with the movies we've seen in the last 20 years, that's just completely blown up and, and all of our, you know, culture is responding to it, this idea of costumes, this idea of, you know, kind of non-governmental, you know, action at, at a large scale, dealing with things that are, uh, out of this world, literally, whether it's Doctor Strange or the Avengers in space or whatever. It, it obviously replaces, you know, just like many people have thought about this, you know, Grant Morrison has done some incredibly interesting work, both academically and as a narrator with, you know, the, the hero as myth and all that stuff. And uh, mm-hmm. it's uh, it's not new, but I feel like we're still kind of grappling with what it actually means. It's a fun ride, but it's uh, it's got power. And I think that, you know, I'm not the only person that felt it, obviously, especially in the hands of someone like Kirby and Ditko. It, it just... Yeah got to me. So then I, I became fixated on the idea of actually one of the things that Marvel did is it, it revealed that actual human beings are drawing these things and, and writing them, right? The mm-hmm. Stan Lee's, you know, interpersonal editorial style and writing style, winking and nodding at the reader and all of that, but also mentioning himself, of course, first and foremost, <laughs> and his collaborators put in my head, but this is something that I might like to do for the rest of my life, actually draw comic books. And uh, one of my older brothers in particular was really exceptionally talented as a cartoonist. Like he could draw well, but he also had that cartoonist eye. Like my own style tends to be more illustrative and he was just really good at coming up with that dynamic synthetic line uh, and uh, storytelling. He wrote his own stories and I just followed in his wake and tried to keep up. And um, my specialty really was always more in the finishes 
And uh, I think that, you know, most of my career has been uh, certainly where I made more of an impact has been as an anchor, which suited me fine. I, like when I was a kid, I, I really loved seeing who was inking whom and how it would look different depending on, you know, like Paul Glace in particular stood out. It just, I mean, everybody really like, you know, with Kirby, you could see what Joss, Joss Emmett brought to the table was remarkable. He clarified Kirby and just gave it something extra that no one else had really put there before. And then um, uh, when Kirby went to uh, DC, Mike Royer and uh, number four, the number Bruce Berry, you know, followed up, I think, on what Senate had established, which is really respecting Kirby's geometric kind of quality, you know, his square knees and elbows and all of that stuff. And bringing out that power that was getting yeah. softened under other people's inks. And I think Jacoya did an amazing work in King Kirby, but Frank Jacoya, and I'm naming names that most people don't know, I don't know if you're familiar with any of these, but Jacoya yeah. was a really talented Italian artist who worked in a classical style. And I thought he did a pretty good job, a really good job capturing something of Kirby in the same way that Sinnott did. But Sinnott just brought something more. Like Jacoya made it made it really elegant while being true uh, to Kirby's work. I could see that inkers made a big difference. And I thought, hey, I can handle that. I, I can trace, you know, I can trace really well. And uh, <laughs> I, I wanted to... Um, Paul Golasi was so good at inking himself. And I wanted every, every once in a while, like Ben Atkins would ink him and he was good. Other inkers were interesting, but most of the times they took some life out of his work. And I um, I thought, yeah, I'd, I'd love it someday to ink Paul Golasi. Never actually got to do it. But, you know, that's sort of what, what drove me into uh, the thinking of myself as an inker, which later came in handy when I realized that uh, the penciling was just too taxing, you know, I couldn't uh, really keep up with the kind of focus that's required to uh, produce work on a deadline, you know, month after month, etc. as a penciler, but as an inker, it's like, hey, someone else has done all the heavy lifting, I can go in and clean things up, you know, so that was great. And uh, that's, yeah, that's a long, the long version, uh, I could make it longer, but of how I got interested in comics, basically, yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, that, <clears throat> the inking phase is so important to bring the art to that that page the way that we yeah. come to expect it in comics uh, and and so important for atmosphere i mean again thinking about something like the walking dead um i imagine oh, yeah. it's a joy to yeah. work it with um is it charles charles adler is that right charlie adler yeah amazing yeah. i mean I, that's the other thing that i love about inking it's um, you're collaborating with someone and it's not the kind of thing where you're doing the pencils and you don't quite know whose hands are going to end up. And you actually, you know, have a say in what the work looks like. And I, I try to have some kind of rapport to the penciler. I found that if, if I can um, maybe see some of her pencils uh, in on paper, which nowadays doesn't always happen with, uh, you know, you send work digitally. Uh, I, I, I really... I like the opportunity of getting deep into an artist's work and understanding their work and learning ways to interpret it. And um, I find that uh, there's no one that I've worked with that isn't better at inking themselves than I would be because there's a purity of vision and a clarity of vision that, you know, uh, you're not going to sustain. I think there's a few pencilers that really don't like to ink. Like, I know I hear Kirby didn't really particularly care to ink himself. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, Michael Lark is great. I think in his own work, Lee Weeks, um, you know, Butch Geis and uh, Charlie just, you know, and uh, Trevor, you know, her sign, whom I worked with recently, you know, these are all people that are incredibly talented artists and can really bring their work to completion when they ink it themselves. Sure. But uh, I like to think that, you know, me and a handful of other inkers are like second best option, you know, it's just like we can go in there and hopefully whatever is lost from the artist's original vision, there's something else that can replace it. And I try to bring my own life into the line. I'm not a particularly technical inker, mm -hmm. but I try to infuse the spirit of the story and the spirit of the art and just kind of um, do an almost musical interplay with the pencils and uh, you know get some, something exciting going, even in just uh, the line, mm -hmm. which sometimes it surprises me that editors 
even care because it doesn't make that much difference, but it makes a little difference. And, you know, some, some of us like it and appreciate it, you know. Uh, but nowadays, coloring, I think, has taken over um, that role in terms of atmosphere, tone, mood. So much more is done with color and can be done with color, but uh, inking is definitely not as important as it was for the first hundred years of comic book art, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I like having been part of the more traditional sort of, you know, uh, kind of, you know, that school where you had Kenneth and Raymond and, you know, you're clear line, you've got, you've got, you know, um, Winsor McKay doing Little Nemo. There's so many different ways of approaching a line drawing, basically. And it's given me a chance to really appreciate the power of line, shape, black and white. Mm -hmm. But I can't deny that when the technology uh, got to the point where it allowed the quality of reproduction that we have now, it just left room for color to move in, and color is an amazingly powerful art tool. I mean, of course, it can be wielded better or worse, but um, you can introduce things that you know you're not really going to touch on with black and white. Mm -hmm. I like the fact that Walking Dead stayed with gray tones. Every once in a while, it's good to just have a good black and white piece of art. Yeah. But uh, I'm also glad that there's been room for colorists to really stretch out and make their mark on comics and, and really become collaborators at this really high, important level where, you know, back in my day, there were a few colorists that stood out. I remember Christy Shield was great. And of course, later, um, Lynn Varley and Richmond Lewis coming in with Frank Miller and David Mazzucchelli doing really outstanding work as colorists. And there were a few other colorists that were really remarkable, but, you know, it was really, uh, you know, background work. And, um, you know, now it's like, working on uh, Gotham Central with Matt Hollingsworth and Michael Lark and Ed. Uh, and I guess uh, Greg Rocco was on that book too, actually. In fact, he wrapped it up. But, um, you know, Daredevil and uh, Gotham Central. Actually, Daredevil was Matt Hollingsworth on Gotham Central. It was Lee Lowridge. It really felt like you've got, I, I keep going back to this idea of musicianship, you know. You've, mm -hmm. you've got people that really know what they're doing in their role and uh, it just sings, you know. It's like that's... Yeah. That's very satisfying, and it's nice to see coloring really taking up that that space. Basically, that used to be mostly, you know, up to us. Um, yeah, but you know, still like the line. That's uh, that's my thing. Yeah, yeah. I like the comics orchestra metaphor here. I, I really like that. <laughs> it's really part of the fun. It's uh, it's something that drew me to the medium almost as much as the idea of drawing and doing stories. The fact that it's it's a way to, especially after I moved to the States and, uh, you know, you, you love comics, you find other people who love comics and it's a community right there, you know, mm -hmm. it just, uh, and uh, to this day, you know, just uh, globally even, um, it's easy to have interpersonal relationships when, uh, when, when, when you know that somebody's interested in, in that thing that we love, you know, so, yeah. and then working together even better, you know, you get good, good conversations with anybody and, and great work experiences with uh, other professionals, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, good stuff, you know, like going back to fandom, working with people in Denver, you know, on fanzines and stuff like that. It just really, that's a positive experience for me. That's part of the joy of being involved in comics you know yeah yeah any um particular collaborative experiences that have been especially energizing yeah i uh, think you know going back to daredevil and gotham central by the time we got to daredevil in particular um you know we'd already done a few years of gotham central and uh, uh our editor, Warren Simons, and uh, and his assistant at the time, Alejandro Bona, really, you know, just uh, encouraged this sort of team mentality. And uh, we just had an email thread going forward and uh, everything we had to deal with, it just everybody was bouncing things around. If I needed to fix something, like, you know, I remember one time in the feet, like too small or as cute a face and people are getting back to me. Matt Hollingsworth and I were going back and forth on stuff that we needed to figure out what's the best way to do this page. Do you want overlays? You know, it was a really great working experience. I was also I was working on Gotham Central. I was moving around from place to place. So it was just a little more grueling, like finding a place I could print out my pages and uh, 
a place to scan them and send them. It was just, you know, back then it, it ended up being complicated. When I was working on Daredevil, I had my studio set up, I had my scanner, I had my printer, you know, I had my email and my phone, and it was just a great work experience. Then um, also the early, you know, early stuff, like when I was working on a self-published anthology called Crimson Dreams, just, you know, getting to know other artists in the area, Frank Albanese, who's unfortunately no longer with us, and Kirk Beth um, and I just started this little magazine and, and you know, it was pretty exciting. It was part of the 1980s black and white boom. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, you know, we sent um, our samples out or, you know, a mock-up of our first issue uh, or parts of our first issue to one of the biggest distributors at the time, Bud Plant. And he was talking to us about like, eh, I'll order a few copies of this, but you know, you guys should look like, I just got something that, you know, like this, I think will really sell Teenage Ninja Mutant Turtles, you know? <laughs> and we're like, Teenage Ninja Mutant Turtles, that sounds so dumb. That's a ripoff of Daredevil and, and, and Titans and X-Men, you know, what are we doing? You know, it's just, uh, and then, uh, you know, I, I grew to love what, uh, what the guys did with that because they, not only they, they put out a book that obviously you know, really made its own mark. Talk about, you know, great iconography that generations of people are still responding to and doing variations of, but also really just, uh, generous, basically, uh, to the community, founding Tandra and uh, in addition to Mirage and just uh, providing a forum for other people. You know, it was, it was, uh -huh. uh, that that was great just being part of the this developing in the black and white market kind of you know being on what dave sim and uh, the peonies on elf quest you know had done mm -hmm. they've seen on cerebus and then harvey picker on american splendor and great i i got to meet him um you know early on in my career sat down next to him at a convention really great guy really great book um and you know in, in so many of us were just kind of trying to keep up not just with the uh, building an audience but just doing good work you know and, and mm -hmm. failing at it but uh i was lucky to meet steve siegel and uh who's you know if, if you're aware who he is actually i don't know if he's been on your show he'd be a good interview subject if you can get him yeah um yeah. even i met in college and we collaborated on kafka which was being published by renegade which was uh danny Bubert's publisher publishing outfit after she you know uh left Cerebus and uh, that was a great collaboration too just uh, you know it was just the two of us and uh, actually he had uh, his now uh, wife I think or life partner anyway whatever whether we officialized it or not uh, Lisa was part of the team too and uh, he was doing the lettering paste up the whole thing I was just doing the art and the covers and uh, we were both taking classes at the same time. I don't even know how we did it and just put up the six issue mini series that um, ended up being well received. It, you know, got nominated for an Eisner and uh, that was very gratifying. And the working experience itself was really fun. It was just a classic sort of, you know, like two young people trying to do something significant and uh, fun. Mm -hmm. And then um, I, I really, every working collaboration, like I, I love working with Trevor on Deceased and he and I had worked together on Valiant stuff before that uh, a little bit. And he's a great guy. I got to spend a little bit of time with him at a convention in Italy in the past couple of years. And um, um, and just as an artist, you know, I, I learn a lot from everybody. And the same goes for, again, Michael, Charlie, Lee Weeks and Butch guys come to mind, but also, you know, Manuel Garcia, like everybody who's art I've had the opportunity to work with uh, has given me something very kids and it just uh, but the highlights would be yeah early early jobs dirt devil was just you know like we we're firing on all pistons for a while and Gotham Central I think stands out as possibly the best book that I've ever worked on it's something the walking dead is is, is kind of a phenomenon in and of itself mm -hmm. um so it's it's hard to say, okay, you know, it's Gotham Central, we're, we're like apples and oranges in a way, but The Walking Dead is outstanding. Gotham Central was just this little jewel, basically, you know, just yeah. 40 issues and we're out. And um, I was really glad that was my first, I'd done inking with Rick Holberg before. There's another artist that uh, most of my collaborations with Holberg were um, on storyboards. He uh, hired me as a storyboard cleanup guy for him and we worked really well together on boards. 
And then I wanted to work with him at DC when DC started giving me, you know, some bits and pieces. And um, because he's very fast, he's very good, and we work well together. And uh, I like what we did on Batman Family. Um, and it was really fun working with him. But the working conditions, like, I was having a hard time keeping up with stuff. He had to pick up most of the slack. So that was, you know, just a bit grueling. And also, I think DC at the time was just not responding to his art style, the sort of animation influence that he brought in. Mm -hmm. They just didn't want it. We might have done better if we'd been on one of the Batman animated books that uh, they were pushing around the same time instead of the main Batman. But uh, Rick is great. And I learned probably more from Rick than anyone else because we worked very closely together for an extended period of time. And he's he's amazing. You know, he's just uh, he's, uh, he's an incredibly good comic book and, and animation artist, you know, with just a wealth of experience. And uh, on the other end of a generational spectrum, Rick's about maybe 12 years older than I am. And uh, here in Seattle, I have connected you know, with some people in the community. And even if we haven't collaborated that much per se, we've done a minimal collaboration, but uh, we sh I've shared the studio with uh, Moritat um, and uh, Brian Tees, and uh, they're both really great artists working in different styles. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a bunch of other artists in the in the group, but you know, mostly it was the three of us and uh, Tony Akins also, whom I also collaborated with. Amazing artist, just uh, really looking at his pencils, his original up close. One of the finest comic book artists who just kind of flies under the radar for some reason, mm -hmm. but uh, he's outstanding. And I, I had the chance to ink him on a couple of occasions, and and and. Uh, I, I don't wish we'd done more because he's better inking himself, really. But it was really great to just have the opportunity to work with him. And um, that relationship, Brian and I, Brian Tees and I in particular, it was just the two of us in the studio for a few years and we were working together. Uh, he was assisting me on some of the work that I was doing with Michael Lark and Butch for Marvel Comics and Butch Guys for Marvel Comics, like the uh, Gunslinger stuff, the Stephen King thing. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And... Um, and then uh, Winter Soldier uh, comes to mind. He took he took over Vinks, and at first we were working on it together, and then he took over when I went to Valiant. And uh, just sharing a studio with someone was something that I didn't think was going to work for me, but at the time it made sense, and it was one of the best, you know, kind of professional experiences. Even if it wasn't so much, he was doing more his work, and I was doing my work. Sometimes we just jumped in and helped each other, but that was a really positive working experience on the whole that whole time period was very fruitful i think for both of us and just kind of fun you know yeah. so i if people romanticize working in comics sometimes and you know i probably don't need to reaffirm that it's 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 a hell of a difficult business and 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 and, and it can suck suck your energy and leave you you know completely burnt out which it has but um a lot of the excitement that I could pick up reading Marvel comics and this, you know, like humorous glimpses into the Marvel bullpen. Yeah, of course it's BS. It wasn't really like that. Right. In some ways, it is like that. It's just, it's, it's, uh, there's something of the energy that actually is there when you get a bunch of creating people, creative people that are actually excited about doing what they're doing, you know? And um, so I'm, I'm like almost 60 years old, so you can hear the reminiscing tone in my voice. I'm definitely like looking back with, you know, pink rose colored glasses on and uh, very, very happy with uh, having had that career that I thought of. I would have, you know, and being able to uh, get a lot of really great assignments as an inker and The Walking Dead, Disease was almost like, you know, cherry on top, but The Walking Dead was like the icing. It's like for six yeah. years, basically, I got to work on this blockbuster with two of the best people. In, and, and actually, I, I should say four of the best people because uh, Cliff was great. Cliff actually uh, is a really amazing artist. I mean, he does gorgeous work, both drawing line, inks, colors, the whole thing. But uh, for some reason, he ended up um, just, you know, doing the tones for The Walking Dead. And I think that when Charlie, uh, when we started publishing twice a month for the uh, All Out War arc, 
they realized that as fast as Charlie is, penciling and inking, you know, two books a month would have would have been more than he really wanted to deal with. Uh-huh. They were looking for an inker, and I think that someone really great turned them down. And uh, you know, I was somewhere down the line, and probably the work that I did on Gotham Central had caught their eye because it's got that kind of noir gritty vibe, and um, they could tell that I, you know, would be able to get the mood right, like you were uh-huh. saying. And uh, working with Charlie and working with Robert Kirkman and, and Cliff Rathburn and, uh, and Russ Wooten, you know, wow. I mean, like that felt amazing. It wasn't as, um, as much like there wasn't that kind of email chain. You know, I mean, obviously Robert's got, you know, way bigger fish to fry, but he was there when needed. But it was just, you know, we, we weren't communicating as much. Also because um, there wasn't as much of a need to. That was a machine that had been running, you know, for a long time. And I was in there just kind of like filling a space that Charlie had been doing. And uh, it's interesting because you can see a alteration in the style of the book when um, when I came on. But people might think that I brought that in. It was actually Charlie. Charlie changed penciling approach when uh, he stopped thinking himself and just decided to take the opportunity to draw bigger. He used to work at a smaller size. Mm-hmm. And uh, really turn in probably for himself, he probably did more like layouts and finished in ink. Mm-hmm. And uh, knowing that someone else was going to ink it, he wanted to have that degree of control over the finished product. And so he gave me pencils that I had to tell him, you know, look, I could just darken the contrast on this and these are publishable. Like I, I don't even need to ink them. So he made the job very easy and there wasn't a lot of reason to go back and forth. Everything was just, you know, very straightforward. And uh, uh, so in some ways I had less room to play as an inker, Mm -hmm. but it was also amazing to see just really being able, I've I've looked at Charlie's work possibly more than anyone else in the world because I sat there with hundreds of his pages just looking closely at the panels and uh, that, that was just amazing he's uh, you know there's like some panels that he did that i would like blow up and just put up on the wall you know it's just like oh, and, and it's just like it's not even the it's not even the dramatic stuff it's like it's carl walking on a field and there's a chicken in the foreground and i'm like wow you know <laughs> it's just beautiful yeah. Yeah. so yeah working with charlie and uh, robert on the walking dead and and of course all the hype that was going on at the time with a walking dead it's just like all of a sudden you know all your kids friends are like oh wow you're you're your dad walks on the walking dead, works on the walking dead. So <laughs> it was a big deal. And um, I, uh, yeah, it's just that that was a really great experience. And I was lucky to have that opportunity.